So I'll just walk through a very simple example just to give everybody an idea and then we'll get into your thing. Uh, so let's say this was a factory. Uh, what is the constraint in this factory? So these are machines. Machine yeah. E can produce 9 an hour, D can produce 10 an hour, 6 an hour, 10 an hour, 7 an hour. Raw material comes in here, finished goods comes out here. What's the constraint in this very really simple factory? It's all serial. Which one is the constraint? Now, in this structure, let's say this was the actual factory, which machine is the constraint? C. Right? We can only produce six per hour. Okay. Let's say that the demand is 24 red and 24 blue. And what if machine C is only producing red digits? Are we exploiting the constraint? Right, so we can produce, let's say the machine can work uh, 8 hours a day, so you can produce 48 widgets in a day. And the demand is 24 red and 24 blue, and you end up producing 48 red. Did you exploit the constraint? Probably not, because whatever you have made, you can't sell. Right? Now, so the first idea of exploiting the constraint is working to what is the true demand. Knowing what the true demand is and working to what the, and only producing what the true demand is. Right? Let's keep going. Now, what happens in this system if machine B goes down for a little while? Right? Let's say machine B has maintenance or has a problem. Does the output of the system suffer? Depends on how long it's down. But we have capacity to recover on machine B. Right? But what happens if machine C goes down? That's a true loss. Right? You can't recover from that loss. So every second loss on the constraint is a second loss for the entire organization. So this might be just one person working on this constraint and there might be 100 people working here and 100 people working here, right? Their output is not critical. What is important is the output of this one person, right? Does that make sense? So this is a very different mindset. If you think about how organizations look at efficiency or look at productivity, they look at every single department, look at every single person and try and make every single person busy or utilized fully or efficient, right? How often do, is there clarity around what the real constraint is and to make sure that the constraint is being fully utilized, right? That's the real challenge over here, figuring out where the constraint is and then making sure that the constraint is exploited. So let's say that we have some breakdowns over here, right? C is still working, but the risk is that C's output will get hurt because you'll run out of inventory, you'll run out of material, so C will run idle, right? So one way of protecting the constraint is to have a buffer in front of C, right? So you're protecting the constraint's output by creating some buffer in the system, by creating some inventory in the system. That's the Second idea is how do you protect the constraints output? Now this starts to get into the idea of subordination. Because where do we want this buffer? Do we want the buffer to be here or here? No. Do we care if A or B is idle? We probably don't care if A or B is idle, but we do care if C is idle. So having the right inventory in front of C is a key part of exploiting the constraint. Right? Make sense? This is all common sense. Like the, the, the amazing thing about theory of constraints is that when you think everything that is there is common sense, but it is not common practice. Most organizations are not working this way, even though it's common sense. Like, keep going. So how do we subordinate the flow? So we know that if we, what will happen if we allow machine E to produce nine an hour? Or if every machine is trying to produce the maximum it can, right? So machine D is trying to produce 10 an hour, 
he is trying to produce nine an hour. Everybody is trying to maximize their own productivity. What will happen to this factory? What will we see? Right. So one thing which we will see is that if this is producing nine an hour, we will see a lot of inventory start to pile. Right. What else will we see? If we are trying to keep this machine going and this machine going, we will see a lot of expediting. Because as soon as they run idle, they want to expedite. What will we see at C? We are, what we will see at C is that instead of subordinating to the true demand, instead of making what the market needs, we are making something to keep other people busy. So we might be running big batches. We might be doing other sorts of optimization just to make sure that someone else is busy. Makes sense. Does this happen in reality? Like I know you all are, right? Do you experience that? Right? That's the core difficulty over here. Is that when we are trying to do local optimization, all the decisions we make, right? They are right from the local optimization standpoint, but they are completely wrong from the organization standpoint. Okay. Yeah. So when you take a linear system like this, yeah. So it's it's a very focused one linear system. But as soon as we correlate it to a optimization in an organization at different levels, uh, so sometimes control, monitoring, and, uh, you know, and, and the, you know, better results come out of local uh, optimization. But, um, I mean, you cannot just eliminate it because you want overall organization. But, you know, so what, what I'm trying to come to is, maybe there are building blocks that, you know, in itself with a system like this, yeah. and then overall there is a so, you can take this idea and you can apply it to your department. You can apply it to yourself first, right? You can see what is your constraint, how is your, like whatever activity that you do that's your constraint, are you focused on it or are you distracted with a lot of other things? So you can apply it to yourself, you can apply it to a small team. It doesn't mean that you'll not get results, you'll get local results, right? But it's like improving machine D. If by chance I happen to be machine C and I improve myself, by chance if I improve myself, I'm going to see an immediate gain in the overall organization. But if I'm not machine C and I improve and go from 10 to 12, it's not a bad thing. I have generated more protective capacity. I'm not going to be the constraint. I'm not, even if I break down now, I have more than enough capacity to recover. So it's not a bad thing. But you're not going to get huge benefits for the organization. Right? Knowing what the constraint is creates that leverage so that whatever improvement you make suddenly has an impact on the entire organization. Okay. So this is kind of the idea around kind of how we would subordinate in such a system by putting in buffers at the right spot, by breaking batches, by subordinating to the true demand, market demand, by making sure that we don't let more stuff come in. Right, and then monitoring what's in the buffer and expediting based on what we really need. Right, in this simple factory, that's how we run this factory if you were thinking according to the theory of constraints. And that's very different from the way that you run the factory in the traditional way. In the traditional way, we run the factory to optimize every machine. In fact, there would be a formal measurements of efficiency and utilization at every machine. Right? Okay, so now keep this in your back of your mind. This is kind of the general idea. What I'd like to do next is introduce you to URZ.